Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science on Tap. Science on Tap is a program of the Sea Science Center, and this virtual season is uh, sponsored by uh, Cambridge Trust. And we have a great topic for tonight. We have the evolution of aviation. Uh, this is uh, in not just a global uh, topic, but it's something very local as well, as uh, the New Hampshire legislature passed a law last year that uh, allows aircraft to travel on highways to and from airports. And uh, the, New Hampshire, the city of Manchester has approved uh, moving forward to um, creating a vertiport in the mill yard um, for vertical takeoffs and landings. So things are happening near us. So it's a very local topic as, as well as a global one. So we're very happy to have uh, three panelists to discuss the evolution of aviation with us tonight. And I will introduce them now. Our first panelist is Kyle Clark. Kyle is an engineer, test pilot, and founder of Beta Technologies. He is a native Vermonter and craftsman who has always had a passion for hands-on work. He founded three companies and designed and built products ranging from innovative furniture to massive power systems. After founding iTherm, where he developed novel high-frequency power electronics, Kyle worked as an R&D engineer at DynaPower. His passion for aviation continued to call, so he launched Beta to begin development of an electric vertical takeoff aircraft. Under Kyle's creative direction, a relentlessly focused team of engineers at Beta developed motors, inverters, batteries, and went on to fly the largest electric aircraft in the world, twice. Kyle holds a degree from Harvard University School of Applied Math and Engineering, where he studied flight dynamics and control algorithms. He also certified, he's also a certified flight instructor and licensed commercial airplane and helicopter pilot. So please join me in welcoming Kyle Clark. Our next panelist is Keith Amon. Keith Amon is a distributor for New Hampshire for PAL-V. Keith is a small business owner, software developer, uh, specializing in pharmaceutical marketing. And he is also a cryptocurrency adopter and enthusiast. He serves as a New Hampshire state rep for Hillsborough District 40, uh, several terms, I believe. Uh, I'll let him uh, elaborate. And he is also a private pilot. So please join me in welcoming Keith Amon. Our third panelist this evening is Mark Jennings Bates. He is the vice president of sales for North America for PALV. Mark has been an entrepreneur since his teenage years and was accepted as one of the youngest fellows of the Prestigic Institute of Sales and Marketing Management in the UK. His business interests have given him a broad experience in many industries from advertising, uh, excuse me, from adventure guiding to real estate development. He has also led teams of, on aviation world record adventures. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. And, uh, for PAL-V, Mark is responsible for sales in North America, and he is also a private pilot. So please uh, join me in welcoming Mark uh, as well. And so at this point, we'll, we'll uh, give the panelists each a few moments to talk about uh, their expertise and what they're doing right now. And as uh, this will give you uh, a chance to formulate some questions, and then we'll uh, open up the Q&A after that. So uh, we'll go in the same order that I introduced you. So uh, Kyle, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about you, what you do? As you mentioned, is in grid tied uh, power electronics for pulse modulators, car charging, uh, missile systems, all kinds of real high reliability um, power electronics. But my passion was always in aviation. I, I designed, built, and flew all kinds of different aircraft and. Funny little story, I, I pitched Beta Air as my senior thesis at Harvard to everybody that would listen. And my first business was funded by a guy actually out of uh, New Hampshire, just south of Manchester. Um, and he, uh, he came to the presentation and he said, I'll invest in any business you want, but not that. And, uh, and he said, anything but aviation. So he ended up investing in a, uh, in a power electronics um, company that I had also created actually in my dorm room at Harvard doing solar cell soldering. But I, I spent every dollar I made on planes and helicopters and always wanted to get back to it. So when, um, when I met somebody by the name of Martine Rothblatt who founded SiriusXM Radio and United Therapeutics, good friends with Dean Kamen, 
she, she enabled me to do this by uh, allowing me to follow a, a really simple algorithm for technical development, which was break the problem down into the simplest elements. And the four simple elements of electric aviation are empty weight fraction, as it is for every airplane, lift over drag ratio, or how slippery the airplane is, the propulsive efficiency, the, the rate at which you can transform that super precious energy in a battery into meaningful propulsion, and of course, energy density of whatever fuel you use, in this case, batteries. And with those four things, you can estimate the range and thus the commercial viability of any aircraft. So this aircraft has four top rotors that are 12 feet in diameter, has a 50 foot wing, 14 foot tall tail and 44 feet tip to tail. It's a big aircraft. The pilot sits up here in the front and it has six seats. Uh, this is what it looks like from the side. In this picture, it's got skid gear on it. It takes off by exciting those four top rotors, much like a oversized quad. But internal to here, there's actually four motors driving that one rotor. Um, you can lose up to two of those motors and still fly the aircraft. So the redundancy when you put, you know, my big button there has to be somewhat, um, somewhat robust. And, uh, and we can't tolerate a corner failure, of course. Um, that's me getting ready for a test flight. And that's what the aircraft looks like from the front. A couple of neat aerodynamic features. You look at the booms, which are these longitudinal members, you see they're a little droopy. They're actually shaped to the entrained flow of the wing. The tail is offset from the boom and the, and the disturbance that happens with these rotors. I should mention that once you take off vertically, you stow these rotors longitudinally into the wind. So they're, they're very, very low drag. Um, these motors don't have fairings on them now. These are very conformal with the, with the motors on it. And this three-bladed pusher prop with a 400 kilowatt motor pushes you through the air. We, we've done a number of hover flight tests and fixed wing flight testing to expo ex expose the corners of the envelope. Uh, this particular test has wheels on it um, to take off and land like an airplane. And, and I think that much like, you know, the, the gyrocopter experience, the glider experience, the electric plane experience is different than what most of us ever think about when we think about light aircraft flying. The visibility is remarkable out the front. This is during a test flight over Lake Champlain, this is Valcor Island to the left, and it's silent. There's, the prop is 40 feet behind you. It's moving relatively slow in cruise and there's no engine noise. You hear the wind much like you do in a glider. It's, it's gonna change the anxiety and the, the way in which people approach flying. Um, this is a similar picture, picture with wheeled gear on it. Just to kind of show you some of the neat aerodynamic features of the dihedral in the center section, the anhedral in the outer section, the progressively larger horizontal stabilizer and the split elevators, split ailerons, which allow this fly-by-wire system to have what I call aerodynamic voting at the surface. Um, so the aircraft is this, as it, as it sits there, um, we'll go 250 nautical miles. Um, you know, the rotors are off it for this test. When they're on it, it it'll take off and land vertically um, at one of these, which is uh, hopefully going into Manchester, right across the street from you guys. And this is a 1.3 megawatt vertiport with a de-iced, we're up here in the Northeast as well, a de-iced deck on the top. Um, but one of the neat features here is that to, to charge something at 1.3 megawatts, those folks that know utility service as well say, oh my God, you could put maybe one of those on a medium voltage distribution line without reaping havoc on it. And, uh, and the answer is no, because we, we use in the containers back here, a whole bunch of arbitrage batteries that we trickle charge off the grid and then slosh that energy from the batteries into the airplane. So it makes for a really low impact um, a draw on the grid, but more importantly, it actually can provide real-time services back and forth to the grid in real and reactive power. And, uh, and it's a four quadrant active front end on the inverter that connects to the grid. And we actually help increase the renewable penetration and the stability of the volt bar performance of the grid by putting these on the grid. And that means you can put a lot more of them on. Um, and and the, the peakiness of the load is totally negated. And the batteries after they're used for flight for about a year and a half go into arbitrage for another 10 years. 
So this is what it looks like in the winter time with NVG lights. And then at airports where you don't need a landing pad, um, we have these, which are um, for those technical nerds in the audience, um, they're different than a car charger in the fact that this, this buck boost converter in here allows us for a voltage range that both charges a Chevy Volt and a 900 volt beta aircraft. So multiple standards, multiple voltages. This is a battery arbitrage box behind it. And these are two independent converters. So there's a number of neat technologies that we're developing up here and uh, would love to kind of talk more about it with, uh, with y'all. You know, we're, we're very close to the community in, in Manchester, obviously through uh, DECA, who, who's been a supporter of ours from the beginning with a number of concurrent um, technical developments. We find, uh, I think, uh, it, it, probably not well known, but we did sign a pretty meaningful deal with UPS. The, the first route that we're gonna be going on is through Manchester. Um, so that'll bring electric package delivery to, uh, to Manchester. And uh, we're pretty excited about it. And I appreciate you letting me, uh, let me share it with you all. Great, thanks, Kyle. Uh, Adele, who's up next? Keith, do you wanna go next? Sure. That was really cool stuff, Kyle. Uh, let's see. I should have put my my pictures into a PowerPoint. Uh, that would have been smart. So my name is Keith Ammon. Uh, I have a PALV sales office at the Manchester Airport. Um, it's in the second build the the second terminal building uh, before the current one, and it's actually called the Ammon Center. And um, the first terminal building happened to be the Aviation Museum. So one Aviation Museum, Ammon Center, and now it's uh, the, the current terminal. So just a little history on Manchester Airport. Um, I, I learned, uh, I, I got my pilot's license recently last year uh, in the same building is a national flight simulator. Uh, and so we've been working with them on different events and different uh, you know, outreach uh, programs, but they have a flight school there. Uh, it's um, uh, right near where the tower is, uh, not, not too far from where the tower is at the Manchester airport. Uh, and so I have a, a, a sales office for Palvi. Now Palvi is headquartered in the Netherlands. Most of the development is taking place there. Uh, they've been working on their product for about uh, for over 10 years. Um, and they've gone through various uh, different stages of prototype. Uh, I can show you some pictures of those. Uh, you mentioned Adele last year in New Hampshire, uh, we passed uh, uh, a new piece of legislation uh, and it really applies to rotable aircraft. Uh, Kyle's aircraft can take off and land vertically. Uh, and so you, you, there's this term flying car. It's, a, it's a, like a whiz bang marketing term, right? Flying car. And it's come to mean lots of different things. Um, a rotable aircraft is more like the traditional version of a flying car where it's, it's an actual aircraft uh, that converts into a vehicle that can uh, travel on roads, but it requires uh, an airstrip um, to take off and land from. Uh, and, you know, th so the legislation that we put through in New Hampshire, uh, we worked with, uh, you know, Palvi was included, of course, but we worked with Terrafugia, which up until recently was out of Nashua. And they have a fixed wing uh, aircraft that folds up. I'll show you some pictures of that. And then we worked with a, a company out of Oregon uh, named Samson Sky which uh, is they're manufacturing uh, a kit that's uh, called the switchblade. So uh, we had a pretty good portion of the rotable aircraft industry represented here in New Hampshire uh, and before the legislature. And we got the bill passed. Basically what the bill does is it, it allows for a, an aircraft to be uh, street legal uh, in New Hampshire roads and, and any states that we have reciprocity which, with, which is, you know, I think everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, an aircraft is a, it's a highly technical, highly uh, advanced p 
piece of machinery, I think, compared to your, your average Hyundai. And uh, we wouldn't want to have, you know, the street corner mechanic turning wrenches on an aircraft that just, you know, would violate um, the, you know, the FAA's uh, oversight on the airworthiness of the aircraft. So what the bill basically did does was, or does is allow you to take your aircraft, uh, your aircraft, um, the proof that your aircraft had inspection, you know, the annual or the hundred hour, whatever is required and show that to the Department of Motor Vehicles and uh, use that as proof that your aircraft is uh, street uh, worthy, road worthy. And then there's a registration requirement as well to get your, to get you your license plate. So that's something unique that we did uh, last year in New Hampshire. You mentioned I'm a state rep. I, I was had two terms and then I was out of uh, office last term. And so, uh, you know, I had connections within the state house to kind of get that bill concept, uh, you know, through. And it was uh, Steve Smith, who's now the deputy speaker. He was the prime sponsor of the bill. So, so let's talk a little bit about PALV. Um, I guess I'll share my screen here, right? And and just tell me if you can see that. We've got it. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I didn't put this in a PowerPoint. That would have been smart. But um, so this is uh, one of the Pal V prototypes. It is a three-wheeled vehicle. You can see my cursor. I'm assuming. And uh, this is in drive mode. And next to it here is a, uh, an, a gyrocopter, gyroplane, the same uh, multiple words for the same vehicle. Uh, and that's the form factor that the PAL-V is in. Uh, this is in drive mode. The rotor folds up on the top. There's a, uh, a tail that extends out. It has a pusher prop um, similar to Kyle's vehicle. And the rotor is what provides lift. Uh, so, you know, this is a gyrocopter that you could get in, you could take off down the runway and, uh, you know, get airborne in it. Uh, it's a two seater side by side, similar to how the PAL V is. But I, I included this picture because it gives you a clear shot of the rotor system. Um, a fixed wing has a lot more surface area to keep it airborne. So, uh, a gyrocopter is kind of like the intermediary between a fixed wing aircraft and a helicopter. It was invented before the helicopter. It's been around a hundred years. Uh, it's a lot simpler than a helicopter. And the advantage to using the gyro uh, plane form factor in a rotable aircraft is the flight surfaces are very compact and they fold up uh, out of the way so that you know, the vehicle can have uh, like, it, it can have good uh, road characteristics um, instead of like a, a lot of extra things that you're carrying with you it's very compact for you know the, for taking with you everything that you need to fly when you get to your destination this was the first prototype uh, from PAL-V it's called the PAL-V1 and it was in I believe 2014 that they flew uh, this aircraft the first design was a uh, front and back, like a, a tandem seated uh, configuration. And they've since gone to the side by side. Uh, let's see what else we got. I'm gonna go through the brochure. So it's a car that flies and a plane that drives. So the, there you can see the two different um, uh, you know, configurations. So when it's in flight mode, the uh, landing gear extends, uh, the, the tail boom ex uh, extends out the back and the rotor is folded in half. So the two piece rotor system on either side. This just gives you some different uh, views of the vehicle. So there's what's, what the interior looks like. It's a Italian uh, leather, similar to like an exotic vehicle. This is hey, high -end, high -end vehicle. Yeah. We're still seeing the one, uh, the first. <laughs> Are you serious? So, well, we're seeing the, the, I think you might've switched two, two photos. Yeah, you know what? It looks like I have to stop sharing that 
And yeah. I didn't like share my whole screen. Sorry about that. No problem. I'll just, this is the a there brochure. We go. Now we it's see got it. some pictures in, uh, in order. So it'll be a little easier to click through. So this is the, just everything that I said a minute ago. <laughs> Imagine that you're looking at it now, right? Uh, drive mode, flight mode. Um, you know, there's the rear of the vehicle. The, the rotor folds up underneath these cowlings. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing interesting about this vehicle is it's built on something called the Carver system. So uh, Pau-V bought the rights to a uh, technology that allows the vehicle to, to kind of tilt. You know, it's a three-wheeled vehicle. So the, the, the front wheel stays in position, but the back suspension will lean you into turns like you're driving a motorcycle. So it gives you the feeling that you're flying through the corners. And, you know, I, I can send you an electronic version of this later. I won't read all of this. Um, this is the interior of it. So you have your instrumentation, you have your steering wheel, and between the driver's legs is a stick for uh, when you're flying. That gives you your control in the air. And uh, some of the uh, performance characteristics, max speed in drive mode is 100 miles per hour. Top speed, uh, zero to 60 in less than nine sec seconds. It's got 100 horsepower in drive mode. It actually has two uh, Rotex engines in it. So when you're flying, you use both engines. When you drive, you use one. 31 miles to the gallon. You have a huge range on the road, 817 miles. Uh, and it just takes unleaded fuel. You can fill it up at the gas station. And then in flight mode, 87 miles per hour uh, at economic cruise speed and, uh, and so forth. Maximum useful load is 542 pounds. And it has a very short takeoff and landing. So it's uh, 590 feet for takeoff. And uh, landing roll distance could be as short as 100 feet. So you're coming in, uh, your landing's more like a fixed wing, but it's, uh, it comes in a much shorter takeoff and landing distances. And I mentioned the other two vehicles that we uh, partnered with to get that build done. I'll just show you, I think I had it here. So this is the Terrafugia, in case you haven't seen it. And stop sharing and reshare. How's that? You can see that, right? Yep. So they have a fixed wing uh, aircraft that folds up. Uh, and then this is the Samson Sky. This is kind of some uh, an artist rendition of it, but it has a ducted fan in the back. It's a three-wheeled vehicle and the wings kind of fold up like a switchblade underneath it. Now, all these vehicles are uh, hydrocarbon powered. Uh, and what's interesting about the work that Kyle's doing is, uh, you know, the forefront of electrification of aircraft. And I'm sure Kyle can speak much more to this, but you know, when you have a fuel tank and you're flying, uh, that fuel tank empties, so your, air, your aircraft gets lighter. And with an electric vehicle, uh, not so much, right? You have to maintain the initial weight uh, even when you've expended energy out of the battery. So that's a, that's a technical challenge that you know, is being solved. And uh, eventually I think electric aircraft will um, you know, be the norm. But right now, uh, you know, with PAL-V, there's two things about it. Uh, using proven uh, technology like the Rotex engines, where it's a very common engine, um, as far as like uh, the safety of the aircraft, and then using existing infrastructure, which is, you know, we have roads, we have uh, airports, there's 5,000 or so small airports all over the country. So you can pretty much land anywhere and uh, you know drive to your destination. So that's uh, the approach that PAL-V is taking is existing infrastructure and you know more traditional technology. They do have a long range uh, concept for an electrified you know, vertical takeoff uh, vehicle, but the PAL-V uh, that we looked at is what is coming to market uh, very soon. And I'll turn it over to Mark. He's, uh, as he said, he's the uh, VP of sales for North America. And I'm sure he can 
fill in some of the gaps that I left. If Thank you, there. Keith. And uh, yeah, that was excellent. And Kyle as well, very impressed with the uh, design. Uh, and I think a lot has been covered. I know the magic in a conversation like this is often the, the questions afterwards. So I don't want to take too much more time. Uh, but just to give you a very quick uh, bit of background, I did in 2011 or 2012, um, I took a team and we set a world record in Australia, actually, for flying paramotors on the longest expedition that anyone had done. And uh, not unlike any of these endeavors, when you design a, a, an aircraft that's out of the norm, uh, we were overwhelmed with people telling us you won't be able to do it, you'll die, you, you'll never get over the Nullarbor Desert, whatever it was, there was always a, uh, a contrarian that would say, no, you'll, it'll never happen. And so um, we, I think we ended up setting three records in Australia and then the, the world record as well. Um, so it's a challenge, but I came back from that um, and wanted to see if I could be the first person to fly at that time, a gyroplane around the world, which has subsequently been done. Uh, but somebody said, you should talk to Pal V. So I called them and I was just dumb enough to say, hey, you should give me two of those and I'll make you famous. And, uh, and they're Dutch. So they said, maybe, which is, uh, I don't want to offend any Dutch people in here, but that's a typical Dutch response, perhaps. We'll think about it. But if it's going to cost money, probably no. And, uh, but we got on very well. And they, they ended up saying, you know, would you like to help us in North America? So it's been a fabulous journey. And that was several years ago now. Um, and uh, Keith has, has very um, eloquently talked about what we've designed, which truly is a hybrid between a, a car and an aircraft, which gives engineers a, an awful lot of excitement because a car is heavy and has a low center of gravity and a plane is light and has a high center of gravity. And so they, uh, if they can save us two grams in a week, the whole team that is focused on reducing weight has a high five and goes to the pub and has a beer and, you know, we save two grams. This is awesome. Uh, so it's a very, very challenging program and even more challenging from the, the route that they took, which was to design, purposefully design a fully certified um, aircraft under FAR 27 and the FAA regulations uh, and the, the similar one uh, with the ASA in Europe. And uh, you might have seen some media releases a few weeks ago, which was the EASA uh, announcing that they've reached the certification basis for PALV, which is absolutely fantastic. So we really now just need the flight trials and we are able to release the vehicle to the market with the pilot owner's handbook and the operator's handbook, and they will know what they can do and can't do with their aircraft. Um, so it's a very unique solution. It'll be one of the, in fact, probably the first one in the marketplace, frankly, now that Terrafugia has exited. Uh, but I think what you see with Kyle's design, and kudos to you, Kyle, I think we've, as a, an industry, we've all been looking at what everybody else is doing, and there are always lessons learned, whether a vehicle actually gets to the market or not, there's always lessons learned. And I think the big fundamental lesson that you see with cars design is that in the instance of catastrophic failure the vehicle still flies it has wings it has lift and you're able to fly it to a safe landing and i think uh that becomes the basis for any certification for ev tolls in the future and yasa has used that statement explicitly the vehicle with catastrophic loss must be able to be flown and what you saw was a a paradigm shift in EV tall designs, it suddenly turned to tilt rotors, which have their own inherent challenges as well. That's why the Osprey that the military uses in the US is still not a commercial aircraft. It's too dangerous at the moment. So mechanically moving wings to create this lift and then move it to forward thrust is very challenging. What you see with Carl's is this very interesting hybrid. And one of the, the, the challenges that that design solves is when you use that electrical battery pack to lift the aircraft, there is so much energy that is removed from the batteries that there's an immense amount of heat. And without a, a fairly decent forward flight at fast speed, you can't cool that pack down fast enough to then use the same energy to lower the aircraft to the ground. And so a lot of the, the solutions that you've seen so far are struggling with controlling that heat. And I think the hybrid that you see with uh, Kyle's design is going to solve that problem very eloquently. So uh, kudos, Kyle. I think it's a super design. I'm looking forward to seeing it advance. But uh, let me turn it over for uh, literally for some questions and answers. And Kyle, you may have some comments. I might have just completely said something that doesn't make any engineering sense because I'm not an engineer, but I think that's what I see in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll just comment super quickly then you're right um, that the 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 way we thought about the design as much like your two grams example um, anything that we don't put on the airplane into the form of code there's no gearboxes no liquid cooling 
no articulating rotors, no variable pitch propellers, all that complexity that doesn't go on the airplane, doesn't cost anything to certify, doesn't weigh anything and can't break. So, so that's a really important philosophy that we entered this, this program with. And one other deeper thing is that the controller, the flight controller for this, this we've gotten it down to 1200 lines of code. And, and that is compared to 8 million lines of code for a tilt rotor with multiple variable pitch propellers, articulating rotor heads, and simplified vehicle operations. And I put that in quotes because it's really a, an obfuscation of a complex control algorithm in a name of simplified vehicle operations or unified flight controls like the F-35, which means you push down to go down, you pull up to go up, and everything is, is, is blind to the, to the pilot through those complicated control algorithms. So not only on the surface is it simple, but down into the code, it's incredibly simple. And Mark, you know, the, the thermal time constant of the batteries is pretty long. The transition's about 20 seconds at the beginning and the end. Um, so you're only on the top rotors for 40 seconds total in a two and a half hour mission. So it, it is, um, it's a 3,000 pound battery out of the 7,000 pounds of the aircraft. So you, you're absolutely right, Keith, as well, that, that gasoline has some major advantages. Um, and we, we recognize, and I'll, I'll tell you what, Mark, and I'll say this publicly, I'll be the first in line to buy a PAL-V from you guys because that's a badass aircraft. Mm -hmm. And moreover, aircraft have different missions. Like they're totally different missions. We, we don't see you know, other people in the VTOL space going after the cargo logistics and medical mission and designing an aircraft that you can put four full pallets in, right? It's a different mission than putting a couple people in New York City and flying them 30 miles. And, uh, and we celebrate and try to support all those companies because it's moving aviation forward and pushing on the heels of, uh, of regional travel. Then I'll push on the heels of transcontinental travel. Then I'll push on the heels of international travel. With, with a more and more sustainable solution. So um, I'll, I'll shut up and stop talking about our mission, but I uh, would love to hear any questions for, for this. Guys, thank you so much for the, uh, the conversation you started here. Um, so the question uh, for Kyle, um, your, your aircraft, um, is there plans to manufacture, uh, multiple? And if so, you know, where is that going to happen? Um, you know, how, how close are you to public or is that, is, uh, is your aircraft more of a private enterprise, Kyle? Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're a private company. We were lucky enough to not have to go out for funding, um, as a company, uh, initially, um, we, we landed a number of contracts. So we, at this time, decided not to, not to go public. Um, we, we secured contracts with the Air Force, with UPS, with Blade, and a couple other customers, including United Therapeutics, um, you know, totaling a, a whole lot of, uh, I can't, I'm not at liberty to say the exact dollar figure, but it's, it's more than I ever imagined um, in, in uh, sales of the aircraft. So uh, the manufacturing itself, um, we internally manufacture the motors, inverters, and batteries. Uh, we partner with the best companies that we can find in the world for the avionics, interiors, and structure. Um, I believe the, 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 the enabling technologies here are those in batteries, motors, and inverters, and the associated controls. And that's the thing that we've gone very vertical on. And, and we've gone to legacy aerospace to pick up partners that do the balance and then we assemble the aircraft. Uh, we have a pilot production line um, to build our conforming vehicles set up in Vermont. Um, we've built all the airframes that we built so far uh, in Vermont in our research and development facility. And as those know who know aviation know that that R&D experimental is very different than conforming and compliant aircraft uh, builds. So those are two separate facilities. Um, thanks, Kyle. Uh, you know, the question here in the, in the, in the chat, um, it says, what kind of capacity can we expect in our skies for these type of aircraft? 
I guess this is addressed to to all of us, or all, the entire panel. Uh, will the FA, FAA be able to keep up with a lot more craft in the skies? What's the ramp up for time frame? Um, so, you know, Keith, Mark, I mean, how soon can I go pick up a, uh, a pal V and, and uh, go where I want to go when I want to go there? I mean, what's the capacity here? What, what's the timeline? That's a good question. I think uh, Kyle was hesitant earlier, and, and I think everybody is, is to uh, <laughs> commit to a certain time frame. Uh, it's, it's not going to be perpetually two years from now forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with with COVID, we had a you know a little bit of, of a setback, uh, as as did you know every other industry. But um, I believe the latest is a year after the first delivery in the Netherlands. So through uh, the ESA certification, uh, the understanding is once the aircraft is completed certification, uh, that it would be a year. You know, the delivery would be soon after that in, in the Netherlands, and then it would be a year later that the U.S. market gets it. So potentially 2022. Mm. And um, there's a reciprocal agreement between the FAA and ESA. And I'm, we're pretty sure it applies to heavy gyro planes. Um, it's kind of a, a new class of vehicle. You know, the, the, uh, th this isn't a little Cavalon or a little Benson gyro. This is a little bit of a bigger aircraft. But... Um, if it's certified in Europe, we understand that it will be uh, certified basically automatically in, uh, in the U.S. through the FAA, and then deliveries can happen soon after that. And Mark could have, uh, he might have other details. No, I think you nailed it, Keith. That's uh, exactly correct. Um, part of that question is, you know, is the FAA set up to handle it? And I think our we've been talking about flying cars for so long. We think that we're going to replace all of the cars on the highway. Uh, and I think the question is, what are the, what are we trying to solve? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, and I remember giving a talk in Brooklyn and saying, just look out the window. And if you think every one of those people is going to have a flying car, and if that's a solution, I think you're going to be just going crazy if there are that many flying cars in the sky. It's not a solution to anything. Um, so as Kyle appropriately mentioned, all of these vehicles will have this sweet spot, the mission that they're meant to solve or assist with. And I think there are other technologies such as Hyperloop, which will be the, mm. the transcontinental solution for us, probably that they make a lot of sense if we can see them emerge to a point where they're commercially viable. PAL-V is probably that city to city commuter vehicle, frankly, that allows you to land on a, uh, an airport that is either in the city or very close to the city and then drive into your mission. Um, uh, other vehicles will be that last, what we call the, the last mile solution and so those um, smaller eVTOLs might pick you up at the the end of the hyperloop station and take you to the verti port on the, the building that you work in um, so just remember that not everybody is going to use these they're going to provide a solution for an element of the marketplace and yes the FAA with next gen air traffic control is going to be able to fit these into today's existing air traffic control system there's not going to be an issue there yeah uh, just to add to that a little bit. <clears throat> There are over 4,000 airports in the US and there's about six that have traffic congestion problems. <laughs> and and they, they cycle between Memphis and Louisville in the middle of the night and Dallas, Boston, LAX, Chicago, Miami in the day. Um, it's because we've been conditioned to, to go to these super hubs, Atlanta, through the, the airlines the solutions that are being, and it's a big sky, rarely am I up flying between airports and certainly not between heliports and I can't get in or I'm circling. Maybe on the West 34, the 34th Street helipad, I'll circle for 12 minutes before coming in. Sometimes, most of the time the helipad's free. The, and there's five slots there. So I guess what I'm getting at is that the solutions that PAL V and Beta and a lot of other EV toll companies are proposing are not adding to the congestion where the congestion exists. Um, the separation requirements in VFR and IFR conditions likely aren't going to change anytime soon, but I don't believe they have to. They have the technological ability to when we have um, when we have sense and avoid systems that are 
managing cooperative targets. When we fly in for we fly in 12, 13, 14 ship formations regularly, six feet off of people's wing top, three feet. It's not a spacing issue when people know what the other people are doing, is my point. Um, when you don't know what those uncooperative targets are doing, you need to maintain massive separation. That's, an, that's a very, very solvable issue. And I hope we get there. I hope that we have too many electric VTOL aircraft near city centers, too many PAL-Vs, too many interesting, unique, uh, unique um, personal air vehicles burning around the skies and we get to a congestion issue. It's, a, it's kind of a, it's a, I'm gonna hedge and make a problem that doesn't exist yet argument. Um, let's get there first. And, and I'm confident we have the technology to deal with it. We cross each other at 120 mile an hour closing speed at the state highway right out here, six feet apart, routinely, with people that are hardly trained relative to commercial aircraft pilots. My daughter, for example. <laughs> Kyle, Keith, how high uh, um, do you, uh, will these vehicles travel, you know, in, in relation to, um, you know, commercial aircraft? Yeah, so, uh, again, you need a pilot's license to fly these machines. And that's the, that's a kind of a significant hurdle and in investment in time and, and resources, frankly. Um, but at some point in the future, you know, you think about a Tesla and they can, uh, they can uh, send out a software update to have the Tesla become, you know, self-driving or self-parking at least, right? They can, so, I, you know, at some point in the future, we're going to see uh, these vehicles become more autonomous, which would handle, you know, some of the issues with, uh, you know, pilot error or separation issues. Uh, as far as how high uh, commercial aircraft fly typically over 18,000 feet, that's, uh, I think it's class alpha airspace above 18,000 feet. Uh, the PAL V will go up to about 12 to 14,000 feet. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have a, um, you know, a, a sealed cockpit. So once you get up about 14,000 feet, you're kind of pushing the limits on uh, breathing. You know, if you've ever been up to the Rocky Mountains and uh, on the tippy top, you know, you, you start to get a little shortness of breath without supplemental oxygen. So um, 12,000 to 14,000 for the PAL-V. Yeah, and, and I guess yeah, it's it's an important note there, Peter, that um, in the, conge the congestion in airspace doesn't happen at 34,000 feet, 40,000 feet, where airliners operate most efficiently. Um, the congestion happens in terminal areas almost exclusively. It's very rare that you might be off by a thousand feet in class alpha airspace at the flight levels when you're when you're optimizing for wind and that's the worst you get. You may lose two knots, right? When we fly the jets across the country, it's it's almost in, impossible for you to have a deconfliction issue uh, with an adjacent jet. That said, in the terminal areas, so to answer your question directly, our aircraft, we fly it routinely between five and 8,000 feet. It's a comfortable altitude. You get above the terrain. Um, you have uh, time to recover, glide distances, all those types of things. But uh, it, it is slightly less than optimal with an electric aircraft to fly the lower altitudes because you're not air breathing. Therefore, you get up into thinner air. Your indicated airspeed is the same, but your true airspeed is faster. Um, so depending on the direction of the wind, you want to be you know, relatively high. Um, counter that with the inefficiencies of climbing relative to cruising. And there's an optimal altitude, but it's not very high and it's deconflicted with commercial air travel. All right, another question here in the, the chat. Um, so here in Manchester, we've heard about, uh, about the Vertiport, uh, you know, vertical airport. Um, uh, and uh, a question about it, is it functional and authorized for use by a EV aircraft? Um, and does Dean Kamen have a connection? Uh, you know, I, I, What's the connection with the Vertiport and the, the Mill Yard in Manchester and perhaps Army and the, you know, the medical needs of uh, the community as uh, you know, technology develops? Can anyone yeah. speak, speak to that? For, for sure. Um, I guess without giving away anything specific, I, I wasn't aware that that was public yet, but since it is there, then oh, I stories there. Yeah, the stories in the newspaper. Yeah. It's in the okay. paper, yeah. Wonderful. Well, the, the upshot is that um, it, it is strategically placed adjacent to the organ generation facility. 
um, that Army sponsored with United Therapeutics. It is, uh, it will be functional for EV aircraft, initially for our experimental aircraft. Uh, the charging standards are our charging standards, and we're of course putting that in, I, I, I believe. Um, and uh, and um, yes, Dean Kamen is on our board. He's a close friend of mine. He was here in Vermont with me today, um, going through some motor designs and doing some critical design review work. So um, that will initially be used for experimental uh, test flights as well as um, flights under our recently received, we're the first company to actually receive an airworthiness certificate from the Air Force for an electric aircraft. So we recently received what they call an MFR, which is a military flight release um, for manned flight, uh, which is a pretty high bar to cross out of the gates with an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So as you guys probably know, that's a progressive certification basis um, as opposed to the binary certification basis that Keith mentioned from EASA or the FAA, where you hit a certain threshold and it's all safety driven for the Air Force military uh, flight release, as well as the Army. Um, it is a progressive risk based analysis that has a lifting of limitations. We were first limited over sparsely populated areas. Now we're flying over Burlington, Vermont. Next, we'll move to night, then IFR, then we'll move into icing, then we'll move into proximity to thunderstorms, and we'll move into passenger carrying. So there's a progressive lifting of limitations as we burn down the risks associated with the mission that we're flying. So to answer the gentleman or the lady's question who asked about the vertiport, it will be initially um, for operational test missions, and it'll move into metaflight missions for organs. That's what I read in the paper. That's all I can go on is that it's uh to take organs that are uh, generated within uh, the facility there. <laughs> I still can't believe that they're making organs in- uh, Listen, Keith, I, I held lungs in my hands. Oh, and I don't even it want to was a, It was a wild <laughs> thing and the, and the printing technologies they have there are remarkable. Man. It's working really, on ramping it up, Keith. They are working on yeah. ramping it up like a- Can I put an order in for like one of every organ? just in case. You know. <laughs> well, what's neat about this industry is that um, we, we think we're waiting for manufactured organs, but what's happening now is United Therapeutics is actually capturing rejected explantated organs and perfusing them and stitching them back together and gluing them back together and then reintroducing them to the organ transplant network. So if you, as you might imagine, that requires double the transportation than an, air, an organ that comes out once and goes in once. Um, and they go to perfusion labs down in Silver Spring and other, where, other places where the organs are actually brought back to life for lack of a better term. It's not my expertise, but I've seen it. Wow. And it's remarkable technology. So the papers said it, the, uh, the, the EVTOL technology from the vertiport would take organs to and from hosp area hospitals. I, I don't know how much truth there is to that. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's right. And and so um, a, a shortage of organs obviously affects a lot of people's lives personally. And uh, and this is an, an effort. To, Martine Rothblatt, who founded United Therapeutics, her daughter has pulmonary hypertension, is in need of some lungs. And she you know moved on from Sirius XM radio to pursue this mission and is, is hell-bent on finding a solution to save a lot of people and save her daughter. And the, the, the method is to create an unlimited supply of organs. And, so and so that's exactly what the lab there in the mill yard's doing. So I'll Are put there... an order for, for a liver, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Are there, uh, so look, if, if we have a, a vertiport in Manchester that allows you know, a vehicle to you know, take off vertically from uh, you know, the mill yard, are there, um, other vertiports uh, throughout the country where these vehicles can land? Is there a network? Yeah, yeah I guess within this kind of quiet group, I'll, I'll let you guys know that we have nine of them installed and operational. Um, we're quietly deploying a series of net, a network of chargers. We have 30 plus in process right now. Um, and, and we expect to put in the ground game of, um, of deploying these, these charging systems throughout the country, bef you know, we don't issue press releases and talk about a lot of this stuff, but we've been busy getting to work. Um, and I think by the time we get to certification and, uh, and, 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 and civil applications of this, 
we will on the backs of our military contracts have a very important network of sustainable aviation throughout the country. Wow. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. Um, Adele, any other questions you had on the, on the back burner that you uh, might want to uh, interject at this point? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how fast that hour went because this is so fascinating. Yeah. I didn't even notice the hour went by. Um, so it's, it's yeah. about the time that we ask our panelists if there was something that we wish you had asked or something you really wanted to share with us but we didn't get around to, you know, your kind of your parting words or uh, what you want to share with us. Uh, Adele, I have just a quick question. Um, the mast on the PAL-V, does that fold down with the engine moving or are there moving joints within it? Can you explain briefly how that, that magic works? Yeah, I don't know if Mark wants to take that one, but uh, there's some yeah. manual process. Go ahead, Mark. For sure I can. Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, Carl, there's very little moving parts. It's the same as you. You've engineered it down to the most critical components that you need to be able to fly. So the the overhead rotor disc is obviously not driven. So unless you're spooling that rotor up for a takeoff where we can pre-rotate the rotor, there's no direct connection to that in terms of a drive. So it disconnects, fold the mass down, and we're good to go. So it's very, very simple. In terms of servicing, it's more like a fixed wing than a helicopter. Got it. Th thanks for clarifying, Mark. No problem. So I'll just close with answering the last question there. The batteries that we're using right now are lithium ion batteries. Um, they're, they're not lithium iron batteries. Um, as the question posed, you know, the energy density is, is north of 250 watt hours per kilogram, um, which is right on the kind of cutting edge of uh, a battery energy density um, at the C rates we require for takeoff and landing. Kyle, is there, is there any, uh, I, you know, I get a lot of investment uh, newsletters and stuff, and uh, there's one outfit that's pushing this quantum glass battery technology. Uh, it seems like it's overly hyped in the, in the investment newsletters, but is there anything that's coming after lithium, lithium ion that will have uh, greater energy density? For instance, like this quantum glass battery, is, is that a real thing or is that just uh, somebody trying to make money on the internet? Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, yes, all of these chemistries work. They all have their trade-offs, though. You know, if you if you if you move to a um, a, a lithium air battery or a sulfur battery or a silicon oxide battery, there's there are marketable steps in energy density, um, but that's not the only dimension. So, for example, silicon oxide or lithium sulfur batteries, they they will have cycle lives measured in 10, 20 cycles. And they'll have energy densities that are 500 watt hours per kilogram. Um, and they will may have 40 or 50% expansion upon charging and discharging. So you may get really high energy densities, but what they're not saying is that the battery mechanically has a hard time being held in any reasonable form, or it may have a cycle life that's very short. Or in the case of trading energy for power, which we do all the time in battery chemistry mixes, you can, you can simply say, I have a high energy density battery or I have a high power density battery. And a high power density battery is great for those intermittent bursts or frequency regulation or you know, the acceleration on your Tesla, but it'll be compromised in its energy density. So Keith, I think that the one thing I would say about battery energy de de technologies, there's a joke in the industry, there's liars, damn liars and battery suppliers that you, you <laughs> You, you kind of have to look at all the dimensions okay. and apply it appropriately. There's nobody in the world who doesn't want more energy density, higher cycle life, lower cost, higher power density, and mechanical packaging capabilities. No right. question. You don't get all of those levers moving in the same direction at the same time. Um, they trend in the same direction, and that's why we get 5 to 8% increase per year on average for comparable power energy and cycle life batteries. Um, but uh, there will be meaningful blips, um, but, but be very cautious of solid state batteries and other such things when they're still the size of a quarter and uh, the scalability is limited by some physical property of the battery, like the capture of oxygen. That's a big deal. Okay. Interesting. So the physical limits, there's constraints on how, uh, you know, like with uh, computer chips, you know, the... Uh, 
I think it's like six microns. There's a name for it. I can't, it's not coming to me, but you know what I mean? It's like a physical limit for how thin they can make the, the disc. Uh, we know Moore's law will, will bump into that limit. Is there something similar with uh, battery technology where? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a theoretical energy density for every chemical composition that's storing energy. And for example, lithium ion has a theoretical energy density that's over 500 watt hours per kilogram. But by the time you put a separator in it, you have some inefficiencies, you put a package around it, you put a pressure release fuse at the top and you shove it in a can, you're down to 274 watt hours per kilogram. Hmm. So the theoretical energy density of any chemical composition can never be realized. It's like the old thermodynamics law. The best you can do is break even. The second law is you can't even do that, right? And the can't <laughs> even do that is how close you can get, right? Interesting. I think from a closing comment point of view, um, I would just add that first of all, kudos to New Hampshire, because you have two very credible aircraft that are being discussed here. And as Carl mentioned at the beginning, it's really hard to, to break through the noise and to see what's real. And, and the North American culture tends to be that we, we can design something on paper and then we shout very loudly. And that process is to really raise money. We don't have anything yet, but we've got a solution on paper and we're, gonna, we're really gonna make a loud noise. So it was very uncomfortable for Pal V when I spoke to them and said, you know, we have to have some form of presence in North America. It's just the culture. We don't have to over communicate, but we do have to communicate. And I think you've got two extremely credible solutions here. And I would encourage you to keep the debate going internally and use Carl and use Keith and, and chat to them about what's happening because there are two solutions here that will get, they are viable and they will get into the marketplace. There's a whole pile of already failed, frankly, and there's more that will unfortunately, and when I say fail, again, we learn from them, we can draw from them, but they'll not make it as a commercially viable enterprise. So kudos to New Hampshire, you're really setting the bar high. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Adele, right. I'll wrap us up. Yeah, so I think I think we got some great topics. I'm excited for next year. I'm going to bring up some of these topics. I think we could talk a whole hour about batteries for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, an update on Army. We have discussed Army and a couple of our discussions in the past, but they're just they're just taking off. So we get to learn more about what, get an update from them. So I'm looking forward to next season and hopefully in person at the pub, everyone. <laughs> as far as uh, what's going to be happening uh, in the next few months, um, normally we would we post a little link in the chat here for you to, to support the Sea Science Center as a nonprofit organization. We, we appreciate that. Uh, we're going to forego that tonight because we really like your support um, the, on New Hampshire Gives, which is a 24-hour uh, donation day set up by the New Hampshire nonprofits. It's 24 hours from June 8th and 9th. And we have over $7,000 in matching funds committed uh, by our board members and friends. So we encourage everyone to uh, support us on that day. And I will send a reminder email as we get closer. Uh, we may have a, a joint program coming up next month with, with the Science Cafe New Hampshire. Um, watch your email for that as well. But I can definitely say that on Wednesday evening, July 14th, we'll be joining a national forum um, to discuss preparedness for um, uh, increasing strong precipitation events. Um, so we are going to invite all of you to that, and I hope you can join us. It's an exciting endeavor that our Science Center is participating in with a lot of national organizations, uh, universities, science centers across the country, NOAA, um, for example. So we're really looking forward to participating in that forum, and we're going to invite you to, to join us for that as well. And la uh, lastly, um, in addition to, uh, to that forum, we're going to be doing some citizen science projects. So I'll send you some information about how you could participate on that while you're uh, out in the community this summer. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for joining us. Kyle, Keith, Mark, that was a fantastic discussion. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and your time. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Excellent. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good night, everyone. It was nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.